Hello, and welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. Super excited you could join me today. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of Silicon Alley. Today, I sit down with Chris Beal, the CEO of Connect and Sell, which makes it incredibly simple for salespeople to talk to prospects. And we discuss the intersection of humans and machines and how best enable each to do what they do best. Chris shares the problem with sales and the tragedy of the crossroads, which has plagued the sales profession for centuries, as well as the key to building a great product that people will actually buy. A little background on Chris. For most of the past 30 years, Chris Beal has participated in software startups as a founder or at a very early stage of development. His focus has consistently been on creating and taking to market simple products that can be used successfully the first time they're touched without having to read a manual or take a course. His belief is the most powerful part of any software system is the human being that we inappropriately label as a user and that the value key in software is letting the computer do what it does best, which is go fast without getting bored in order to free up human potential. Toward that end, Chris has been involved with requisite technologies, GXS, Epiance, Clip Media, Aptara, Cadis, Sun Microsystems, and Unison. He's currently the CEO of Connect and Cell. And for those joining for the first time, on the Silicon Alley podcast, I talk to entrepreneurs, VCs, and top performers to understand what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll get actionable advice that you can apply in your own business and life. So go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes drop every Friday. And of course, if you hear something you like, share the podcast with others. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this sales-focused episode of the Silicon Alley podcast featuring the Chris Beal. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying, I'll never leave this place. Well, Chris, welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. Super excited to have you on today. I'm absolutely thrilled, William. And so we were just talking before we hit record, and you were talking about having uh, accidentally flooded the hot tub. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? And uh, <laughs> you know, how do you do that? A- it's so funny. You know, everything in life comes down to this. If you haven't done it before, you're going to screw it up at least once. So I've never had a hot tub. I just moved into a house down here in Southern Arizona. And it's like, I don't know anything about this. So I call the hot tub guy and he says, well, put water in it. I'm thinking, yeah, there's an idea. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, then turn it on. And if it gets hot, you, you, you're like 90% of the way there. So, okay, do that. And then it's like, ah, oh, there's not enough water. So I put the, I put the hose in it today and then got in a great conversation with my son. And I was really focused on him. And suddenly I thought, I wonder what that sound is. <laughs> so <laughs> small ocean, easily dried out. <laughs> well, glad to hear it was just a minor ocean and that you were having a good conversation with your son. I think that's uh, probably more important that you're focused on that versus being distracted by everything else that is so easy to be distracted in today's day and age. So, Yeah, you know how important it is in conversations and it's so... It's one of the benefits of Zoom, I think, is that we actually look at each other and stay focused. And I think when people go off video, I think they're often saying, I'm really just going to do something else and pretend I'm talking to you. Uh, so, but it's, it's very tiring. I don't know if you find it, but I'm hearing from a lot of people that being in flat video land is pretty, is pretty exhausting for conversations over time. Not at first, but over time. Do you, do you find any of that or is it like a nothing? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've, I've read this and it's, I've seen it from a couple different VCs that they recommend turning off the self view on zoom. And I do find that when I turn off the self view, so i I'm naturally, I, I don't know about you, but I tend to look at that picture to see how I look and, you know, get distracted by that still in the conversation. But I find that when turning that off, I don't get as much zoom fatigue um, because I'm more, as you said, more focused on the conversation and, and who I'm speaking with. So when I've done that, I find that I don't, you know, don't have those uh, flat conversations over time. So I don't know. If that's oh, that's a- fascinating. That's fa- so how do I do that? I'm going to do that right now. Is it a view thing? Oh, I have vanished. I'm ghosting yeah. myself. Exactly. I've never, so a- I've never ghost. I've never ghosted myself <laughs> before this spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Chris. So I want to dive in to your story um, do you mind giving just a little bit of background and context for the audience who may not be familiar with you and the work that you do? And then I think it'd be really interesting to start uh, with this concept of users and get your take on why the term users 
is a really bad term to describe people and customers. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I've been building software for a long time, building tech companies since, I don't know, 1980 something, one or two. So 40 years of, of building tech and taking it to market. Uh, how did I end up there? I'm a physicist mathematician with an interest in psychology that had to sell once in order to pay medical bills for my wife's miscarriage. And I became a door-to-door -door salesman overnight. I found out I was extraordinarily good at it because I didn't do what everybody else did. Everybody else knocked on the door and tried to sell. I knew that wouldn't work. So I knocked on the door and offered to do research. And that was it. And I, and I beat, you know, like the numbers were astonishing, 92% door to close ratio in my fuller brush territory. And a big number was like 4%. So I realized, ah, sales is really interesting. It's this un, like over tested, over plowed field, but people really don't get it. Yeah. Like they're doing it as though they're never gonna meet the person again. And I realized the predicate of all of sales was this. I'm gonna to sell to you right now because I might never see you again. I call it the tragedy of the crossroads where sales came about originally as a business because you had caravans going by one way and people with stuff to sell to them another way and you'd never see them again. Yeah. So get the best deal you can, best price you can, give them the worst goods you can. Everybody started to not trust merchants and salespeople and here we are today, right? But there's a different <laughs> way of going about it. So I got fascinated by that. And the more businesses I built, the more I started thinking, you know, the thing we don't do well is sales as a part of the business. And so as a technologist, who grew up actually out in the desert and had to sell to animals. Like, how do you sell a horse to let you put a bridle on it? When you're eight years old, you weigh 62 pounds. And the horse is just like a prospect, right? It's big, yeah. it's fast, it can get away anytime it wants. And if it decides to kick you, it's going to hurt. So <laughs> you've got this issue. Well, you, you, they don't talk to you, but you can do some things around curiosity, which is yeah. you know really important when you're working with anybody, any of us animals. So I got really uh, kind of, you know, kind of imbued in that. And then, by the way, this is a deep background, but I grew up in a house full of books. Okay. My dad was getting a master's. There was no one to talk to except my sisters and coyotes. And so <laughs> uh, I read a lot. You know, I started reading as like, I was reading like Drucker when I was eight years old and not wow. knowing that Peter Drucker is not material for eight years. It seemed good to me, you know? <laughs> so you don't know any better. You know, here I, I don't, you don't exactly. So here I am now running this company called Connect and Sell. And, you know, we just let a, a, a rep push a button and talk to somebody on their list in three or four minutes with no effort. It's very simple. It's just like, I don't know, how do you call an Uber? Anybody can do it. You hit the button, you wait. How do you get a conversation? Anybody can do it. You hit the button, you wait. Same thing. But I, I, uh, I love your question because I put it in my bio, this thing about users. And I put it in the bio for a reason. If you think about how, what a computer can do, a computer can do two things. It can go fast and not get bored. That's the sum total limitation of what computers can do. And I've been programming the damn thing since 1968. And all you're really doing is saying, huh, this thing won't get bored. So I don't have to worry about it losing its attention span and forgetting something or whatever. That's kind of nice. And it goes really fast for things that we know how to do. That's why we program them. And in particular, when you're a programmer, the big construct that makes a difference is the loop. That means I can do something, have the computer do something over and over and over and over and over until I'm happy with it, until some condition obtains and then we'll go on and do something else, right? Well, human beings go slow and get bored. Yeah. So naturally, it seems like instead of thinking about the computer doing something for the quote unquote user who is using it, a more interesting construct is to have the two work together in a way that takes full advantage of the go fast, don't get bored, and full advantage of what humans can do uniquely and solve problems that neither can solve on their own. That's what's interesting. And we don't do enough of that. Like your CRM, what problem does your CRM solve other than not forgetting and demanding that you do a whole bunch of work, right? I call <laughs> it feeding the monster. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I literally cannot put a new account in our CRM because it has required fields that I don't know what they mean. And so I could fake it, Same. but I'm not irresponsible enough to fake it. So I just give that job to somebody else who's an expert. Think about that. You have to have an expert 
who works together with the machine because they got the machine's mental model in their head and can conform to it. It's still a bad, to me, a bad use of computers. A connect and sell excited me because it's a different use. It's like computer and human working together to navigate a phone call so that a sales rep doesn't have to navigate that phone call, delivering only conversations, not dead ends. That's kind of cool. Computer does its thing, goes fast, doesn't get bored. Human does their thing, navigates phone systems, talks to gatekeepers and decides, hey, this is William or not William when the, you know, when yeah. that voice shows up, if it ever does. And you have a happy harmony going on there. So I, I just think that the great uses of computers are not the ones that there's a user. How many computers are in your car? Do you have a car? Uh, not anymore. I'm in New York. So I have, I, that was the one benefit of uh, one of the, the one benefit of being up here is that I don't have to have a car. Beautiful thing. I, I've got a car, I think. Um, I don't think mine has many computers, but my, my fiance has a car. I'm betting there's probably 16 computers in that car, each one of which is very fast. That's a great use case. I'm the human. I'm doing what I do, making judgments. So that's a, that's a little girl trying not to run her over. That's a ball that rolled in front of the car. Stop now because it's going to be followed by a child. Yeah. Computers have a really hard time with that kind of stuff. But th I can't do any lock brakes using my foot and <laughs> yeah. my brain. Because the computer goes fast and it can decide how to chatter those brakes down precisely and pay attention to the little changes. So that's a great way that the computer and I can work together. I say, let's stop and not hit the little kid chasing the ball. And the computer says, I've got this. I know how to do that because it's a, it's a, a rote action where you got to be really, really fast and you can't get bored. You just have to do it until it's done. Yeah. So that's why I say that about those two things. No, it's, it's really interesting, Chris, in your background, both in sales and then obviously programming and technology, it seems like has allowed you to kind of combine the benefit, as you said, the benefits of computers being able to go fast and, you know, do these tasks that humans aren't good at and then focusing on what humans really are good at. How, how did you, how did you start to see these insights? Is this something that you've always recognized or what was the process of like finding this unique insight in terms of the, the, where humans and computers best meet? Well, I started programming computers to, to play games against people <laughs> early. It was like yeah. the first thing I tried to do, right? 1968, I had access to this GE 600 computer. I was a kid living in the desert. My high school, believe it or not, had access to the same computer that Bill Gates used to use, same timeshare system. <laughs> We're at the same age. He's, he did better with his programming career than I did, I think. It <laughs> uh, ver verdict's seems still out. to me. <laughs> verdict's out. We're not, we're not all dead yet, but uh, he's, he's done really well. I really admire that guy. And I, I thought, well, how interesting. I love to play chess. I'll try to build a chess program. And it was in realizing by doing it, that it was so much harder than doing things like, uh, oh, I don't know, difficult integrals in calculus, mm -hmm. right? The, the mental effort that was required to make a computer play chess, which is still a deterministic game, it's in a sense uninteresting, right? Except it has so many possibilities. You just knew the computer could go fast enough to look at all the possibilities, but not really. Yeah. Um, so it was in trying to, to do a, what people call AI myself as my first projects that I started to realize this is weird because I could put a person who's a good chess player together with a computer program that would say, remember opening books and I could choose one. Hey, I feel like playing this opening book and it would have those, you know, those first moves down. But now it's like, OK, now let's turn it over to me. And, but it'll show me, say, the computer could show me obvious blunders so I could avoid them. That would be really cool. So I just started to think differently. Um, and uh, what I found was the desire to have the computer actually do the whole thing, like mm -hmm. think and do AI kinds of stuff, is an emotional desire on the part of certain kinds of people with certain kinds of personalities. That is, they're not comfortable with people and they don't believe in people, they don't study people. 
they you know they kind of don't get it they think people are an inf- are like an inferior form of a computer and if only the person was more computer like secretly that's saying kind of like me you know for that particular personality <laughs> then things would be better because it would be more reliable etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. and what we've you know it, so i just saw it early um I've done tons of AI. I was doing neural networks in 1992 in order to classify products. And again, I found out that the neural network would train me to believe that it was doing the right thing. But all it was really doing was kind of semi-mimicking some things from the training set. And when it came down to the hard cases, I still needed a person in the loop. (laughs) So I just became a believer that humans in the loop are amazing. Yeah. And guess what? They're not that expensive to make. People are making people all the time. Right at this moment, William, while you and I are speaking, there are human beings making other human (laughs) beings. And they're not charging anybody a dime for it. They seem enthusiastic about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's a, yeah, very interesting insight in thinking about AI. And, you know, I mean, we, that's a, a whole conversation around, not myth, but just like the uh, pedestal that AI is on and for good reason in certain use cases, but the reality of where we are today, and then also not looking at what the benefits that humans bring, right? So can you talk to me a little bit about that, about how Connect and Cell came to be and how you started to combine um, the best of the best of the machine and the best of the, the person? Sure. Well, I didn't invent Connect and Sell. So when I met Sean McLaren, who was CEO back in, you know, from before that, but in 2011, when I met him, I brought this home to my uh, now late wife and I said, uh, hey, I've joined this company called Connect and Sell. She said, you did what? And I said, well, she said, we're a customer of theirs. She was an EA for a Silicon Valley CEO. And I said, really? She said, I would never transfer one of those calls. I said, Really? So I went to the system and found three cases where she'd transferred calls and I played one of them for her. And she said, huh. I said, yeah, you transferred that one. Why'd you do that? He says, well, she said, well, the, the guy had an admin making his calls for him. So he had to be important. What was I going to do? Hang up on him? I said, uh-huh. So now why, why does that even work in the first place? Because there is a human in the loop making that call go as well as it can, but it's a less expensive human than than, you know, your person. But she predicted I'd take the company for three weeks. Then I to- she said, do you have a boss? And I said, yeah. She said, okay, two weeks. Uh, so <laughs> here we are. We're 10 years later and I'm still here. And now I was head of products. Now I'm the, the CEO, I think. So the guy who came up with it was overseas. He was in India. And he didn't intend to come up with this. He was just trying to call back to the States and he had a list of people who wanted to call. He didn't want to go through the drudgery of calling and going to voicemail. He wanted real conversations. So he put six people around the table who worked for him, but he didn't want them to talk to the, pro- to who the people he wanted to talk to. He wanted to talk to them. So he said, here's the deal. He took a piece of paper and, and printed out there six pieces, printed out one sixth of the list and taped it down at each location said, hold your finger next to the one you're trying to reach, use this telephone, dial the number, navigate the phone system, do everything you have to do. And if you get the target, don't say anything, hold the phone up in the air. I'll grab it, see where your finger is. And I'll say hello to him, talk to him. So that was the original connect and sell had no (laughs) automation in it at all. It was just six people, six telephones and one sales rep, so to speak. And it worked so well that he said, well, gosh, we should turn this into you know, software. And it was smart enough, however, to know the people were key. So then made a mechanical Turk, an initial one where there are people and they would work for you as a little like a group. You would go, okay, yeah. two o'clock, I'm going to do this. You get your five people, your six people, et cetera. And then the idea came about of, well, that doesn't make sense because while you're talking or taking a break, those people are idle. So can we put them in a big pool Mm-hmm. And have the system reach in and ch- just find one person to navigate one call so that the humans could then be working for, you know, Johnson and Johnson, uh, you know, Billy Franz on, on one call. And then the next call, they're working for a startup somewhere in Silicon Valley. They don't have to know. 
Because to navigate a phone system, you don't need to know who you're working for. You know, so it's like instant fractional admins that are fractionated thousands and thousands of times a day. And it kind of grew through the experience of, you know, making iterative change. When I joined, our issue really was we weren't at scale. So we were in one little box in one data center and it kind of come to the limit. So my first job was to horizontally scale this thing. And we did that. And, you know, that led to some other insights, but that was it. It just a piece at a time. It's so, it's so crazy effective that it didn't take a lot after that. The hard part is going 10 times faster creates process change. Yeah. And process change is easier for smaller companies and harder for big companies. So our big customers have had to eat a surprising amount of process change for something as simple as push a button and talk to somebody. (laughs) Right. You would think it wouldn't be a big deal, but it's 10 times faster. Like here's a process change. One of our customers uh, before they became a customer, they, they were going to hire 400 people top of the funnel. They'd been told to grow from 400 million to a billion in four years by their new owner. They'd been acquired. That's yeah. like, well, what are we going to do? We've got 400 people to hire. And I said, well, why don't you just take the 52 people you have and have them have 10 times more conversations. Then you have 500 people without having any people except the 52. And they're like, ah, oh, it doesn't sound like it'll work. Well, it's actually a big process change to not hire 400 people once you've gotten it approved. (laughs) (laughs) Even though hiring them and onboarding them, ramping them, blah, 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 would take forever. So, you know, we've we've, uh, been down an interesting bootstrapped road Mm -hmm. of selling and learning, selling and learning. And what we've learned is we provide part of the solution, which is the speed. But you still have where, where is the action? It's inside the conversation. So we just launched this week something called Flight School to teach folks how to have great conversations through the actual practice of having live fire conversations with coaching and a psychological framework for the message. And it's so precise that in the first two-hour session as a student in flight school, you get, you get coached on the first seven seconds of the conversation for two hours. Wow. Live conversation. You have the whole conversation. You do yeah. the whole thing. You set meetings if you can, the whole bit. Right? You're making money, still doing your thing. It's not offline training. It's online, live fire. But <laughs> the, co- the coaching is limited to the first seven seconds because 93% of all the outcomes are controlled by what happens in the first seven seconds of the conversation. So I believe that's it, what yeah. we do. <laughs> Yeah, so this is sorry. Sorry, that went that went a few places, but uh. no, no, it's in, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, Chris, and get a get a general idea of of you know how the business came to be and your involvement, and then just you know some of the interesting things that you've seen with your clients, having been in sales, um, doing cold, cold calling and all that. I can definitely agree that that first uh, initial seven seconds is absolutely crucial, um, and getting through gatekeepers and all that stuff is its own its own. Uh, discipline in terms of sales. So what are some of the things that you're enabling when you think about uh, the sales process and how you are changing that process, right? You mentioned being able to go quicker and larger companies have some challenges. How are you, how are you actually impacting the individual sales teams, sales reps, and um, the companies that you're supporting? Sure. If I start at the bottom, sales reps have only two choices, talk to people or don't talk to people. Right. And t- we know talking to people works, but you can't get people <laughs> to talk to. So we, we, that's the big impact is they go from talking to two people a day to talking to as many as they want. If I look at my reps right now, which I won't show you the screen, I'll just look at the numbers. Uh, the, the top SDR for conversations today, just as today, she has talked to 46 decision makers, mostly VPs of sales, set three meetings and gotten 18 follow ups and two referrals. That changes her life. Can you imagine sitting there in a ranch, you know, 70 miles from Denver alone, working by dialing the phone and talking to two people? It's lonely. It's yeah. frustrating. It's not fun. So what we, we have allowed reps to do is focus on conversation first and send the email next, which is a big change. Because the other thing is suddenly email works. So for the reps, it's a big deal. It's like, hey, they're opening 100% of my emails because I just talked to them. Exactly. (laughs) 
So we reverse that flow of send the email hoping to warm up the conversation, which does not work, actually. If you send an email to somebody, you get them on the phone, then you say, did you read my email? There's only two answers. They're both bad. <laughs> yeah. Neither one of them leads to a good place. So why did you do that? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> well, I, it yes, I read it. And I didn't respond or no, I didn't read it. And there's a reason why I didn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And yet we, it's a advised best practice, send emails out to warm up the market. It's nonsense. It has the opposite effect, but people do it because they don't have enough cycles of actual experience of having conversations to know that it doesn't work. Again, at two conversations a day, you don't learn anything, except it's really hard to work in a job where you have two conversations a day, right? So that's at the low level. At the high level, if I come to like, what do we do for companies? We let companies choose what market they're going to dominate and then dominate it with 100% assurance that they're not going to make a mistake and they're going to market. And so think of it as insurance. Yeah. So when you look at a market and you say, okay, I got, I got a hypothesis. Here's my product. My market hypothesis is this list. Well, mm -hmm. for one thing, most companies won't make the list. They just won't. They'll take a description of the market, give that description, call it ideal customer profile, whatever, give it to the sales team and say, why don't you develop the company strategy? Each individually, one at a time. It's a great idea. Let's fragment the strategy and spread it out over the SDR team. It should work out because after all, some of you have been out of school for three, maybe four years. It's going to be fine. You will each individually somehow converge on a go-to-market strategy that's going to be brilliant, much better than the one we could come up with over here. Well, we let the company say, no, the strategy includes a go-to-market strategy. Mm -hmm. It dovetails with a financing strategy, which is really important. How long do we have before we get here, here, and here? And how much money do we have to raise or have? How much customer uh, revenue do we have to produce? What's the gross profit? That's the financing strategy. Well, how do you dovetail that with the go-to-market? If you don't know that the go-to-market's going to work, it, it's hard. So we let them actually do this, ah, make the list, call the list with one or two calibrated reps, have a hundred conversations in two days, look at your appointment setting rate. And if this message sets appointments at higher than 5% rate on cold calls to this list, you can go dominate that market. So the certainty, the certainty of being able to dominate and make it fit with you in your financial strategy is a total game changer. And again, I've been building these darn businesses for 40 years. I can assure you, <laughs> had I had Connect and Sell in the first one, we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would, I'd have more houses, I guess. I'm not that kind of guy, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really, really interesting, Chris. And I, I kind of want to rewind back. So can you talk to me about your entrepreneurial journey and some of the early businesses that you've built and Kind of your experience along the way that made it really easy for you to see connect and sell and be like that's that's unique i mean the entrepreneurial journey started at the age of 11 with my first business called do anything for you because we want to make money i found <laughs> out the desire to make money didn't didn't uh, wasn't enough you had to have a concept <laughs> it was good, good learning so I developed through a few specialties you know uh horse manure really good at horse manure your horse seems to produce a fair amount of it. I'll make that problem go away. I learned fairly early that there's a big difference between making a problem go away, which people like, and offering to improve something which people are bored by. So early on, I learned that making problems go away is a really good way to think about businesses. And adding something is a really bad way to think about businesses. So, you know, yeah. if you can't find a problem you can make go away, don't make a business around it. I think I learned that at 11. And uh, maybe reading Peter Drucker might help because <laughs> he talks a little about that too, you know. But, um, you know, I, I, I got out of school, uh, almost took a job in physics at Los Alamos Labs, uh, running the Maison Physics Lab there. And something told me to do something else. I was going to be a school teacher. And then my, my teacher, my old physics teacher, told me, don't do this. She said, you're an entrepreneur, go start companies. I said, how do you do that? Like, what's the formula? And she said, go to work in an industry that you think is interesting and dynamic. And you'll get pissed off at something relatively soon because I know your personality. When you get sufficiently upset with how something is done that you keep using the word 
stupid over and over and over. Think about, about starting a company to, to make that stupid thing go away. And that, was, that really was the key to everything. So every company I've done has been about making some stupid thing go away. So uh, like requisite technology, the stupid thing was that companies need to buy on the contracts they negotiate but the stupid thing is the employees can't find those products because they're, they're all over these different suppliers. So how do you buy the regular stuff to run a business from a number of suppliers if the employees don't have a unified catalog that's easy to use where they can find something Amazon style before Amazon? Yeah. So let's make that problem go away. And we developed a whole bunch of exotic technology and this and that, but it was always like this. What's Then, then the next thing I learned was you always have to go to the core duty cycle. What is it that's being repeated over and over that's stupid? Because mm -hmm. there's something stupid going on. And in that case, the stupid thing is the employee is going to some random supplier's catalog and ordering off contract and you're paying too much. Okay, well, why do they go there? Because they can find this stuff. So what do we have to do? We have to make these products as findable in a unified catalog across lots of suppliers as they are in the best supplier catalog in the world. What are the principles there? Well, they turn out to be perceptual psychological principles. So how do we understand the world of people finding things? Where, where's their mind when they start? What's their intention? What are the resources they have? So what I, what I learned, and this really affected the connect and sell part of this, the recognition is the human being who is frustrated, who can't do their job as well as they hold themselves accountable for, is the person you need to focus on when you're starting a business. And you need to ask yourself, who is that person? What is it that's keeping them from doing their job as well as they hold themselves accountable for it? Deming taught us this way back in the 40s and 50s. Human beings do not work for money. They work for pride of workmanship. And when they don't have what they need to do their job as well as they hold themselves accountable for, they get frustrated. And that frustration is the signal that there's a problem to fix. So go look for the frustration. Don't look for, even though waste is interesting, it's the emotions that drive the, the hard process of change because change is so hard. So you've got to get to persistent chronic frustration about something, go find that, and then really understand that. Watch it, analyze it, understand it, do it yourself. Get in there and do it yourself. So, you know, Connect and Sell was easy for me. I joined the company quite literally five minutes after meeting Sean McLaren. I didn't go to the meeting intending to get a job. I didn't. I was going to come down here to Tucson and run a solar energy company with an exotic physics-based solar thing. <laughs> and then I met this guy at 630 in the morning. And five minutes in, I said, time out. You're telling me you've reinvented the business telephone to call a list instead of a person. And the mathematical consequences, 10 times more of what makes business work. Conversations between somebody who has a problem or might have a problem, somebody might have a solution. He said, yeah. I said, I'm in. I'm in. He says, what do you mean you're in? I said, I'm in. I'm working for you now. He says, oh, uh, <laughs> what if I'm not hiring? I said, well, you know, it's a free country, Sean. I can work for whomever I want. You can choose to pay me or not. I highly recommend that you do because it stabilizes the employer-employee relationship. That's what I've heard. <laughs> so it wasn't hard for me to recognize because it was dead in my sweet spot, which is yeah. what is more frustrating than not getting to do your job as a salesperson and instead doing this other crap called, I call it commuting to the job site and finding out there's no work to be done over and over and over and getting rewarded one in 23 times. It's just so frustrating. So it was a great, in my model, it's like seek the frustration. I had 20 million frustrated people doing the most yeah. important job in the world, which is, you know, initiating sales relationships. You can't beat that for importance. Yeah. No, it's really really interesting chris and how you just were able to make that decision right away um it obviously goes back to your experience and that insight around solving problems right and and if you can solve a problem you've got a business versus adding value where yeah you know like that's it's yeah, hard to that's that scale when it's like yeah 
Yeah, that's not exactly it. That's yeah. funny. That is so funny. My fiance makes sense. It's like, yeah, you got it. Exactly. There oh. ain't no about getting to talk to people in sales. Exactly. Exactly. That is the job, right? It's to have conversations. So it's really, really interesting. So talk to me about some of the, um, you kind of talked a little bit about some of the outcomes. Are there specific industries, types of businesses, like who can benefit from, from this um, particularly so the audience is mostly entrepreneurs or early stage more so. So yeah, I'm curious yeah. how it can impact early stage businesses. Sure. I was talking to a VC today who works with a portfolio that's not an investment portfolio, but as a, I'll call it a targeting portfolio it has about 10,000 startups and he provides a service to audit where they're at and tell them what they need to do, what gaps they need to fill in order to be acquired or get the next stage of financing or whatever. And we were talking about this and, and uh, he said, well, I can see how when they get to a stage where they need to put on some growth, connect and sell it really make a difference. I said, yes, but yes, that one's obvious, but the most valuable is before you build the product. Fact of the matter is you're going to build the wrong product. Yeah. Software is eating the world. Most products are software products and most software products are wrong for the market because the market is a guess. Eliminating the guesswork about what to build is the number one thing you can do with Connect and Sell. And it's so simple. You have to have two people. Now, you probably don't have them. So you probably have to go get them somewhere. Two calibrated people, I call them, who are known to set appointments at about a 5% to 10% rate on cold calls. And then you take your idea you boil it down to a value message that you, in, that you lock into a psychological message. The psychological message we, we actually provide for free. It helps somebody go from fear, prospect is afraid of you as an invisible stranger, to trust, to curiosity, to commitment to attend a meeting, and then hopefully attending the meeting, right? If yeah. you can get that to happen end to end in a, at a 5% conversion rate or above, it's okay to build the product. If you can't, go fix the message, which becomes the product, or fix the list, which is your target market, until you get product market fit without having to build the damn product. That's the number one thing I would do. Now, if you're farther along, of course, you built the product, you're probably struggling with product market fit because who doesn't? So again, now you can go, wait a minute, we could be going this way or this way. Don't pivot by changing your product and changing your go-to-market, get some headlights out in front of you, have those conversations, look at the appointment setting rate, hold those discovery calls. And in a week or two, you can go from, huh, I don't know, should we internal debate, internal debate? Because that's all anybody does. Talk, 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 talk internally. Screw it. Talk to the actual targets out there and see what resonates and then yeah. go in the direction of the resonance. Yeah, that's really interesting, Chris, because you hear when thinking about product market fit and surveying the market, it's usually a survey, right? It, that's the approach. Or maybe go build a landing page and try to send people to a landing page based on buying some ads or trying to get message. But this is a very different way right. to approach that where you're having real live conversations. Yeah, what do we're doing it right now with Flight School. At this moment, we're doing it. So I hired Cheryl Turner got to be one of the five best cold callers in the world. And she's a big connect and sell fan. She used to be inside sales.com's top of the top, top of the funnel rep. And then she bumped into connect and sell and thought I was an idiot. And then after <laughs> about half of a test drive, she said, Oh, he's not an idiot. He's just weird. But this <laughs> stuff really works. And now years and years later, she just joined and her job is to figure out through talking to people where flight school fits. So I said, I want the Fortune 2000 sales enablement heads and I want you to talk to them and let's come up with the message. And the initial message is something along the, the lines of, I believe we've discovered a breakthrough that turns your top reps into the top 2% of all cold callers in the world so that they can do the most important job in sales, have first conversations that work and they'll love it. So that's the message. Now. Does it resonate or not? We don't know, right? Yeah. So what has she done? She's on day five, I think, on the job. I think she started. 
Yeah, something like that, six, something like that. And today she and I just went over the results, listening to conversations, talking about it and realizing that we did a little experiment. Try this on VPs of sales. They were totally bored. It's like, who cares? Because it's big companies probably, that's my hypothesis. And training is handled by the training department. The VP of sales doesn't do anything with that. So, okay, let's focus over here. What part of the message is resonating? Well, let's hold the discovery meetings and find out by testing the message within the discovery meeting. Why, why was this interesting to you? You know, was it the economic part? Was it the emotional part? Or was it this like, where are you trying to go part that your reps aren't having great conversations? It's we're doing it ourselves. We eat our own dog food in the extreme. We actually don't have any other kind of food in the house, so to speak, but I would not dare to take even flight school, which we've delivered 33 times, had huge impact on companies. I still wouldn't let an internal debate determine exactly who we sell it to with exactly what message and exactly what happens at discovery. You have to step by step do it through conversations. Yeah. So it's an example. No, it's, it's a great example, Chris. And I think that's a testament too, right, of, of be using your own product and you know, obviously if that shows a lot of your belief in it and the value and, um, you know, this concept around running the quick little tests, right? Cause that's, that's the benefit, especially if you're a startup is that you can be nimble, you can do tests, you can pivot, you can change, you are the decision maker, but doing it, as you said, internally and just internal debate doesn't really accomplish anything. If you're not actually going to market and getting feedback no. from potential customers and clients. Yeah. Internally, you find out who has power internally. And you also find out who the biggest, you know, the most, shall we say, the most persistently persistent person is. That is, you'll find out who's stubborn. That's not actually (laughs) an interesting thing to find out. You already knew who was stubborn. So why just go and find out? Because people will give up and go, okay, okay, okay. We'll do it Michael's way. Right. And then it's like, really? We defaulted to this person's way because they were loud and stubborn? Or, well, the engineer controls the code, so we'll do it their way. It, it doesn't work. You got, that's why I think you should do your product market fit work before investing in technology and for, before building anything because your confirmation bias kicks in real hard as soon as you start building you've already, Yeah, you've already built it and there's that sunk cost fallacy that takes place. Exactly, exactly. Well, Chris, in terms of where you see Connect and Sell and you know, defining success in your own you know, life and business, what does that look like? How do you define success for yourself? I don't, I don't have any interest in it. Um, I really don't. I I don't know what success is actually. I wouldn't know. I mean, maybe you live forever or something. That's not going to happen. So, you know, but I define it as I look at the world like this. My dad taught me this. One day when I was very young, it was probably seven or eight, my dad said, you know, Chris, you can only sleep in a bed that's so soft and eat food that's so good. You're going to be able to have that always because of just what you're bringing, you just who you are. So what does that mean? And I thought, you know, I, he left it with me for years. And what it means to me is when you're doing what you should be doing, what I should be doing is things that help other people because it's easy for me to take care of myself. That's not hard. My needs are small. Energy is fairly large, uh, persuasive, all that kind of stuff. So I look at it as how can we help the people who are the innovators, the innovation economy, succeed more often and bring their innovations out. As a society, we depend on the innovation economy working. And it doesn't work as well as we think it should. We think it's working really, really well. Oh, VCs and this and that. If it were working well, would 90% of all funded companies fail? Does that really mean 90% of all the tech anybody comes up with is crap? I'm pretty sure that's not the case, right? So there's something broken there. So to me, innovation happens in small companies. It also happens in big companies. There's all sorts of things going on. Sometimes it's an adaptation, like Thomson Reuters sells off 60% of their revenue to Blackstone. Well, they have to innovate with what they have left because the overhead didn't leave quite as fast as the revenue left. There's innovation that needs to happen. People's jobs depend on it being done successfully. And I find that the, the throttle, the choke point that keeps innovation from succeeding is between the idea and the ability to instantiate it and the market 
and the, the understanding in the market of what this thing is and their ability to take it up. And that's, yeah. that's sales right there. And the bottleneck is the top of the funnel because unless you're talking to enough people of the, of the right kind, you don't know what it is, chicken and egg problem, you're stuck. So most innovation builds up as inventory above yeah. the top of the funnel and then never makes it through. So that's my definition of success is innovators who want to get their their stuff to market are going to be able to do it reliably with low risk and do it fast enough so that if it's not the right thing, everything works. What does that mean for connect and sell? Well, I mean, this is a naturally huge opportunity. It's a multi-billion dollar opportunity because it's just simple math, right? It's like we provide today a couple hundred thousand dollars a day. How many are needed? I don't know, 20 million, 30 million, who knows? Yeah. So for me, it's a step-by-step journey. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry. The team's not in a hurry. We're not flipping anything. One of the reasons to be bootstrapped is so that you're not beholden to somebody else's timeline. Oh, this venture capitalist fund has an end of life. And therefore we have to <laughs> dump your company in the toilet, you know? I mean, I, I, I'm not there, right? Yeah. So um, what are we going to do next that's interesting? I think flight school is going to be big. I think it's going to be really big because people need to learn how to have these conversations. And we're going to do a crypto play that I think is going to be very, very interesting to um, kind of unleash connect and sell for the individual. So it's right now more of a corporate buy, but yeah. I want to make sure the individual real estate producer, insurance producer, wealth management producer, that those individuals can buy a little bit, maybe an off-peak segment, you know, want to get a away seat, right? So we're yeah. going to issue a, issue a crypto called ConnectCoin that you can use to buy at different prices for stuff that we, quite frankly, might be throwing away anyway, because we have excess capacity here and there. And then also yeah. to do that with a a chunk of it where we'll, we'll have a social reward. So connected cell sessions are exciting. You're excited after, an, you know, you spend an hour or whatever, push a button, post it to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram with a little brag. And we'll give you enough coin back to have another way off peak session. So I mean, yeah, so that'll be fun. Innovative, creative ways to, not just be in the B2B market, but open it up to B2B. Well, I, I guess it's just the, the still B2B segment, still B2B, but the individuals you said, like the individual real estate broker or uh, investor, things like that, where you're opening it up to the, 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 the entire market versus just sitting at the Fortune 2000, as you mentioned earlier. That's very interesting. How or even, you- yeah, and even, well, even we're way down to the smallest companies, but it's still a corporate buy. Yeah. And, you know, the corporate, the, our minimum is like you could buy $10,000 for 9,500 bucks. That doesn't sound like much to somebody in a corporation, but to an individual, that's like, are you kidding me? That's, you know, I don't care what it's going to do. I'm not sure enough to do it. So I want to take the uncertainty out yeah. and make it still work smoothly with the rest of this big monster that we built. That's awesome. Yeah. Really interested. So what are the timelines for the, uh, this other offering for the cryptocurrency to enable it to reach down market easier? Do you, do you have the, any timelines yet? No, we got development going on. So, um, and, and most of it's off the shelf, you know, crypto's straightforward. Yeah. Uh, our, our knowledge of our own system is down to the millisecond. We know what it's doing you know, we're not mystified yeah. by what's going on inside that big beast, right? It just is opaque to everybody else. So I'm thinking three to six months, three months would be aggressive, but I, I have a fantasy. Um, somebody's got to be aggressive, why not the CEO, <laughs> right? But I, I think it's highly doable and I know the demand is there. And so, you know, we're going to see what, I, I'm a little afraid of it, except I'm, here's what I'm not afraid of. We control the supply. Yeah. It's like an airline, right? Except we can actually have standing room on our airline. So you can squish a few extra <laughs> without having to add seats. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to sit on the wings, yeah. right? But it's still very similar to an airline model. There's a certain amount of capacity. Some mm-hmm. of it flies unused. So we fly some empty seats now. I don't want to fly empty seats. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very interesting, Chris. 
I want to transition here quickly into kind of the final segment that we've got here, which is talking a little bit more about personal finance. So it's my background, the company that I'm building is in the fintech space. Personal finance is a big piece of that. Could you describe your relationship with money? You kind of alluded to it when it came to success, but I'd love to hear you describe um, what that is today. Uh, it's distant. It's distant. I, I really have no interest in the stuff and I just blessed. I feel so fortunate that money has never attracted me. Uh, I feel for people that are in the thrall of it, yeah. that it's, I think it makes life hard to think that money's going to, going to be magic for you. Cause yeah. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, there are no cases where it was, but I also think it's interesting. You know, I'm a mathematician by background and I think money is fundamentally interesting. And of course I run a company. So I think it's essential. I used to be the CFO of this company. So, you know, it's not like uh, I don't have like a, a thing of a thing with money. It's just, it doesn't move me. I, I've never moved. I wouldn't if somebody walked up to me right now and said, I'll write you a $10 million check to leave connect and sell. I would think, okay, first put your check away. Just instead ignore that. Bring me somebody who'll run the company better than I do. And I'll leave without the $10 million check. I, it, it's just not interesting to me. I, I don't know why. Okay. It's like being colorblind. It's like being colorblind. I mean, truly colorblind. I actually yeah. kind of am so dumb about it. That, so have you, have you uh, always I, been that way, Chris? Because you mentioned, yeah. you know, being entrepreneurial at the age of nine, 11, like pretty, or, you know, when you were really young. So I'm just curious, has it, have you, has it always been that way? Well, I wanted a thing at that point. My friend Dan Stevens and I <laughs> wanted a, ta- we wanted a tackling dummy and we had to get the material to make it. <laughs> so what are you going to do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, I didn't have an allowance. So what are you going to do? There was no other, yeah. you know, so it's necessity, but um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, I was a blackjack player at one time. I played blackjack for a living in Las Vegas. That's a pure money game. Yeah. But it was more the fascination that, are you kidding me? They're up there in Vegas giving away money to mathematicians. <laughs> These people are, I got to go see what this is about. So I spent a year up there as a, as a card counter taking money from casinos and running it at the bank. It was fun, but I, I think it was that experience that actually kind of finished off the money thing inside of me. There was yeah. probably some more of it than earlier, but working as a professional blackjack player and putting, you know, $50,000 down in the, on the tables every day, it just became like yeah. these chips. And, and I think I got, bored with the idea of money at that point. And it was just, how well can I play the game? How well can I do the branding? How disciplined can I be? Can I do this 10 hours a day, six days a week? Can I maintain my health? Can I still go climbing? Can I go running in the desert? All, you know, that yeah. became the interesting problem. Yeah. And then I realized it wasn't helping anybody else. So I stopped. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. I think Chris for diving a little deeper there. Cause I think that that, that's just a really unique insight that eventually becoming, eh, you know, again, go back to the, eh, just over money in terms of, of, you know, not, uh, you know, in terms of it being a goal, right. Cause that's really what you're saying. The money is not the, the goal. Uh, I got to do an order taking deal today where I was called by one of our customers procurement departments and said, well, we want to do 900,000 dials or wh- some, some number. And so I was like, okay. So I, I closed it. <laughs> There you go. A close to half a million dollar deal today without doing anything. And I thought, oh, that was nice, but it wasn't really that satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was good for the company. I mean, I, I do. I have a fiduciary responsibility to the company because we finance Connect and Sell in an extremely unusual way. The top three executives sell and we sell a lot. And so okay. instead of saying sales department sells, think about it this way. When you have senior executives selling, the gross profit from those deals looks exactly like venture capital, but it comes with no strings attached other than delivering value to the customer. And so now you have lots of venture capitalists, customers, but they don't have board representation, governance control. <laughs> they, they don't have special shares, none of that stuff, right? I think more startups should think about, especially in B2B, 
should yeah. think about this. If you're a founder and you can learn to sell, not the, just the special big deals, but be the top salesperson on the team, you actually relieve the financial burden on the company because it is much, much more efficient to sell and take customer money that's well-earned than it is to make pitch after pitch after pitch to investors and hope one of decides that maybe this is where they want to put money to work. Just a little recommendation to folks. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really unique, unique insight. Um, I, again, my background is in sales. So I, I have a love hate relationship with sales and sales reps personally, you know, I, you know, I love them, but at the same time, they're also a pain in the, the butt. Um, can be right. Yep. You know, you, you mentioned that you're not necessarily at this point anymore driven by the money, but that's, I would say that that's not the case, at least for early on for a lot of salespeople. Right. Cause that's, that's the measuring stick. That's the measuring yeah. stick. It's revenue. Yeah. Which is funny too, because for the business, it's, you're really, it's a different straddle. Sure. Revenue, you're going to get a multiple of revenue for valuation someday. Big, it's kind of a big deal, right? But it's also kind of like big deal. It's the gross profit flow that's the equivalent of financing, but without dilution. Every dollar you take in gross profit is a dollar you don't have to take dilutively at some point. And if you look at it that way, it's a two for one. And so, and then you didn't pay commission on that also. And to, to give you an idea, I mean, my VP of sales sells $6 million a year at Connect and Sell. He sets more test drives than anybody else. He's a great VP of sales. He, he runs a great organization. He trains, he coaches, he forecasts well. He does all this stuff, right? But that leaves a lot of time in the week. And so, but he also is more active than anybody else. He has the most calls, the most test drives, most discovery, most by count. And he lets the chips fall where they will. He's not swooping in for the big stuff. He's just showing them how yeah. it's done. And I think that in every organization, the more selling is going on at the top, the less stress there is on the organization to do dumb things over time. Interesting. And so you're saying that the reason that there's less dumb things to be done over time is because the top understands customers better, is not giving away equity in the company for or dilution to investors. Yeah, maintaining control in case change is needed. It's very hard to pivot when, if even a little pivot, if you have to go to your board and say, hey, by the way, we were wrong, right? Yeah. So the more control you have, the better your chance of dodging when the big brick is thrown at your head instead of going, I wonder if I should go get permission to dodge. <laughs> I mean, it's a brick coming at your head, right? Oh, but we committed to X, Y, and Z. Here's the annual plan, blah, blah, blah. Those are all nice. Put them put them in place, don't worship them, and, and get out there and sell and get firsthand information too. Somebody once told me a long time ago, um, a venture capitalist friend of mine actually, he said, the only research I trust is primary research. Primary research is where you are out directly getting that information and you get information when you sell. Every time, 100% of the time, you get it when you have a cold call that doesn't convert. You get it when you have a discovery meeting that doesn't convert. You get a little bit of information about what does work. That's nice. But you get to surround your understanding with the information about what didn't work and reason from that. Giving it to sales, all you see is what does work. You're blind to the world that doesn't work or you don't believe in them. Oh, that's an excuse, right? But when it is you, you know if it's an excuse or not or a yeah. signal. And you need every signal you can get as fast as you can get them. And you need to have the executive team reason together from shared experience. So sell. That's the shared experience. Yeah. That's really interesting, Chris. You know, I mean, there, there's obviously on the, I'm thinking from a technical side, the engineering side of trying to get engineers out speaking with customers, because that's obviously a, a really important factor where, as you had mentioned earlier at the top of the conversation, um, you know, users rather than focus on users, focusing on the people, the, the actual customers. And that's something that oftentimes is siloed when you think about technology companies is engineers or product not really getting to communicate and understand what customers' wants and needs are. We've been focused, obviously, on the, on the sales side and the net new customer, but I think that there's also something to be said about existing customers and that same philosophy that you just talked about. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things to think about is who are your customer success people going to be? 
And are they really about customer success? Are they about something else like renewals? So you can tell, it's easy to tell, do you compensate them for renewals and upsells? In that case, they're not about customer success. They're about renewals and upsells. They're salespeople, right? So having people who've done the job that the customer has done, but have kind of an engineering mindset, problem-solving mindset, putting them in charge of customer success or in customer success roles, and then saying, by the way, your job is to have the customer pay us as little as possible and get as much as possible. That's what we're holding you accountable for. If you do that, you create long-term value for the customers and therefore for yourself. If you don't, eh, you're just all kind of shilling for something, right? Yeah. Please pay us. Please pay us and don't tell us the (laughs) truth. That would be really nice. (laughs) Yeah. So, Chris, getting back to the the finance, in terms of the uh, best investment that you've made, what would you say that is? It was an investment of a day to visit Silicon Valley at the request of a venture capitalist friend of mine. I took a day and I went and visited a company. Um, didn't know I was there. He wouldn't tell me. It was a blind meeting. I was, I was walked into a boardroom. I didn't know who was going to be there. I didn't know what the company did. I didn't know anything. That investment has really paid off. And it, paid, it wasn't dollars, but it, was, um, it paid off in uh, letting me meet some people that have been with me ever since. And those people are, are the bedrock of what I do now. That's awesome. That was a long yeah. time ago, 2005, 2005. Okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting when you think back on those investments, because in, in my opinion, they tend to not necessarily be monetary. They tend to often be, as you described, relationships or maybe investing in yourself. So now on the flip side, yeah. Chris, what- yeah. What would you say is the dumbest money mistake that you've made? Oh, um, that one's easy. So it was a failure on my part to sell a $4 billion acquisition deal to my CEO and the board of directors at Requisite Technology on April 3rd of 2000. (laughs) It was, uh, it cost, it cost uh, $4 billion. The company eventually sold for, 19 million in uh, spring of 2006 with 11 million is still in the bank. So uh, whatever I should have done as the chief strategy and corporate developer and officer to, to sell that $4 billion deal instead of the $9 billion IPO that never happened. Uh, I was a big, I, I don't even know what all the mistakes were, but I can go back and catalog it minute by minute. And I must've made a ton. It's easy. Yeah. Easy looking back now based on what happened in uh, with the dot com bu- uh, bubble. But <laughs> uh, yeah, that one cost me, cost me $32 million between a Wednesday and a Sunday. But I, it's a good thing that you're not measuring and you don't define success by money. So <laughs> it makes it easier. You know to- what? I, I would, would have totally screwed up my life. I, I really would have. It would have screwed up my life. I, mm-hmm. I was not, um, I was old enough to know better, but I, I don't think I would have even as disinterested as I am in money, other people are really interested in it. And I bet I would have done some raft of dumb things. Yeah. Self-awareness, self-awareness. Well, Chris, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate the time. If you want to leave the audience with the last word, um, anything that you want to impart on them, and then also how can we learn more about Connect and Sell and how can folks connect with you offline? Uh, here's, here's my recommendation to anybody who wants to have a, have a great life, be bold and be curious. That's it. I mean, you know, if you can do that, life is actually fun and, and, uh, you can be fun and stable, but if you're not bold and curious, it kind of like, yeah, whatever, as you said, (laughs) (laughs) uh, anybody wants to get a hold of me, uh, chris.veal at connectandsell.com. LinkedIn is, I'm very, very active out there and, I accept almost uh, every LinkedIn invitation that isn't obviously from somebody who's just going to pitch me immediately. So, <laughs> and even that's all right. So Chris 8649 out there. And then I have a podcast called Market Dominance Guys. It, it, it's all one word. It's marketdominanceguys.com. Guys like the car guys. Yeah. Anybody wants to really learn about the crazy things that I think about market dominance, there's 70 episodes and growing out there and it's a cookbook step-by-step or how to dominate markets without fail. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Chris. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time and uh, we'll have to do it again soon. 
I'm looking forward to it, William. Thanks so much. On your way out, please share the podcast with others that you think would get value. It's the only way the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs just like Chris. And of course, pound that subscribe button so you get notified when new episodes air. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying, I'll never leave this place.